I can live with that. Okay, good. This is the Free Jury's Brain Call for Monday, July 22nd, 2024. Uh, and we were just talking about Kizuna uh, and an article that I didn't read all the way through, so I didn't have your reaction, Jack. So I will read it through per currently. But the first thing I hit was the definition of Kizuna. And I'm like, that, oh, The yeah. definition is benign. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, somebody's turned it into to, uh, an Ebola virus. Very interesting. Or the, the social network or, or the Black Mirror episode where everybody has to like everybody. Um, yeah, and you have to read more at Wild Intelligence. Ah, uh, yes, which is a company that, that Yael co-founded, which is trying to create some kind of ethical AI, but... The... Well, he's kind of strange because he says to build high-performance systems in an AI dystopia. So he's being right out front. Right. Because he defines a dystopic uh, vision right above that. Yeah. Uh, uh, but that may be an acknowledgement that this is the world we're in. Like yeah. the, the AI dystopia is our reality. And the question is, how do we uh, create bubbles of autonomy in an AI dystopia? It's, it's a perfectly valid question to ask. I'm on board with that. And now, 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 I'm not saying that's what he's doing. And I think a lot of people... It's a she. Sorry, but... It's a she. Okay, a lot of people don't really have a very, very clear uh, intuition of what's dystopian and what's utopian. And of course, there is people who will have different ideas about what's dystopian. Uh, I certainly find a lot dystopian these days. <laughs> Some people's uh, what are they, what is the saying? Some people's whatever is other people's sausage. No, how does that go? Is is it, somebody something is somebody's poison? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, anyway, but yeah, uh, the, the, I've been thinking a lot about AI and politics, as you know. Uh, I'm not the only one. Uh, Steyer had a interesting uh, conference call yesterday on that topic, which I unfortunately missed. Um, but the so much is happening in that space. And what we're seeing also is a strong dystopian vision that is at the basis of a lot of Silicon Valley ideology. Uh, the, the, there was a recent article about uh, right, like fascism, fascism creeps in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. but that's just the, the bibliorical recommends, but that's not. An interesting one. I mean, basically, it's been the whole. I, I remember talking about the whole uh, desk reel slash uh, no sphere uh, dystopian sources in this uh, in this community. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there there's a strong number of people whose vision of an ideal future and is ultra optimized to the point of denying human autonomy. So that's just a reality. And of course, the more we are plunging towards ecological catastrophe, the more uh, temptation there will be for uh, strong action, so, quote unquote. Now, of course, whether a lot of the strong action in question might be techno solutionist and not useful, but... Don't look up. The, 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 the temptation is there. It's yeah, going to sure. be there for all of us as, as, as things get worse. Absolutely. Anyone else have strong feelings? Apparently not. There is this very weird recent, I think it happened around the Republican convention, sort of a congregation of big money uh, technocrats, tech valley people uh, to back Trump. Uh, and I just now added a, a little clip of Pete Buttigieg um, being asked that question by Bill Maher, who I'm not that fond of. Um, but Maher basically asks Buttigieg what he thinks about Peter Thiel backing J.D. Vance and about J.D. Vance. I will post the clip here in the in the chat because it's so amusing. And Pete Buttigieg in his inimitable fashion 
um, just tears a hole in the whole argument and says, you know, this it's much simpler than we think it is. This is actually, these people are very rich men and they've all decided to go back the Republicans because historically Republicans are really good for very rich men. So would you like to go on record as to why you don't much care for Bill Maher? Uh, yeah, I find his opinions are often uh, ill, ill argumented. Uh, I find he's trying to sort of cut a middle ground, but it's not convincing to me. Um, I m would much rather listen to John Stewart. I find John Stewart's arguments to be very liberal, but wow, like irony aplenty, but also rooted in things that I would agree with in lots of ways. And I find Mars arguments not, uh, maybe they just don't match my reality or my perceptions of reality, but I don't like where he's coming from a lot. So uh, is it is it say to the, you're not actually center left, but leftish? I don't know. I don't know that I'm that way crazy left because a lot of, so for example, when Bernie was running against uh, Hillary, against Trump back in 2016, 2015, I loved Bernie's critiques of the system. I didn't like any of his solutions to the system. They sounded like 1970s far left big government solutions, which I'm not fond of. I think that's part of our problem is that we try to create institutions to solve our problems. So I don't think I'm, I'm on the left, on the, on, the, on the faulty, flawed, increasingly fragile left-right con, uh, continuum, I don't think I'm out on the left on that. But I think I have some really, really uh, progressive social ideas like, yeah, gay marriage and equality for people and equal pay and whatever else, sure. It, but to come back to Mar, I think what you said, Jerry, is it, it wasn't a matter of his political position. It was a matter of his ability to argument his, or, or argue his position. Correct. And there are other people who are in the middle or in a nearby political space. And I'm like, I, I would have a hard time refuting what they just said, where with Mar, he just comes across to me as uh, flip without being clever and ill grounded, and that's and that's just my taste on Mar. You just muted yourself, but you may be talking to somebody nearby, Jack. Oh, I think he is. Yes, I think he is. The the one thing that absolutely broke my heart was how the um, the blockchain people managed to unseat Katie Porter. Yes. And this is part of the tech. We don't care about fascism. <laughs> we don't care about it as long as our interests are met. Katie also got herself into a really bad pickle because there were three or four very good candidates all vying for Feinstein's empty seat. <clears throat> and once and only somebody was going to make that race and everybody else was screwed because they gave up the other thing they had for that spot. So that, that was like a really bad crash. It was like a crash at turn two in some race where you like all the leads. Fair enough. Uh, but I agree. I just post, post, uh, posted the JD Vance takedown into the chat. Uh, it's an, it's only two and a half minutes or something like that. It's very, it's very. Uh, I, I, I gave a foundational desk real link for those who. Thank you. Uh, Tesk Real is a not a very felicitous acronym like uh, like Darvo. It's uh, one of those really great concepts that has a sucky name. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll just give okay, I, I general. Just back. Yeah. You're back. Good. Yeah. I probably missed all the really good shit. You did, but there's a recording, so hey. Yeah, uh, no, not that much. Uh, we were asking about the, we got a bit more into the politics of it. Uh, sh sh should we do a, a round and uh, try to yes, talk about non-political? Like non I know I know the politics is planned for Thursday where I won't be, but you know. <laughs> um, I would love to hear where everybody is. Uh, so let's do a, a check-in round like that. Do you want to start, Mark Antoine? Um, I am uh, not wearing the society hat anymore, or society library hat anymore. Uh, I think it was decided that uh, my plans are a bit too uh, uh, ambitious for what they can do right now with limited means. Uh, they had a bit of a, let's say, uh, windfalls that did not materialize. Uh, 
uh, that's also part of the problem. The I don't know what that means short term, long term. Uh, I am busy uh, on two axes. One is I'll finish open sourcing the non society library parts of Claim Miner, so it's finally becomes available. I've been talking about it for so long and uh, restarting work on some of the hyper knowledge fundamentals right now. I'm also spending some time with the uh, global mind people, uh, Felix and all uh, there. They got the MetaGov money and uh, not much, but it's a good, uh, it's a good foot in the door. Uh, and who is that Felix, which Felix? Felix Dietze. Uh, I, you, I thought you had met him. He's not uh, a scammer. Pardon? I don't know Felix. He's not in okay. OGM. He's not in OGM? Okay, okay. I thought he was. Well, he, uh, he, ha he has been in an OGM, an, OGM, uh, an OGM call or so, but that's about it. Right. Yeah, I think he came once. Exactly. Yeah, he, he was in the Dawn of Everything book circle briefly, I think. Okay, so let me let me tell you about what he's doing now. I think it's extremely interesting. He cool. started with a great uh, thinking tool called Woost. Didn't make money out of it and had to pivot. Uh, he worked on an alternate algorithm for Hacker News, more better attention-based algorithm. That was one work. But now what they've come up with is, I think, is extremely interesting. It's, it's again, an attention algorithm. So the idea is, if people, if someone votes on a post, I think I told you about this before. Someone votes on a post and votes on the child, then the vote the vote on the on the on the original on the parent post is considered to be informed by the by having read the child. The more you've read the children and descendants, the more your vote is informed. So we can compare the uninformed vote for those who have not voted on descendants to the informed vote and kind of extrapolate this is where the informed vote would kind of go to, and this is where the uninformed vote is. And we can look at each individual post's contribution towards moving people towards the informed average. And that gives us, well, this is probably the most informative subpost, <laughs> or even the most, if, if it moves you away from the informed average, this is the most likely disinformation subpost. <laughs> Uh, so it's a measure of information quality in a conversation. Uh, and they're, they're working on perfecting that right now. Do you have a link to the work? Um, Absolutely. Thank you. Me, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, uh, it fits what we're doing for sure. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. What they're doing is absolutely valuable. Uh, give me a second. Anyway, go, go, go on while... Let other talk while I'm looking for links. Others talk. Nobody. Bueller. Yeah, Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. Uh, nobody wants to talk about the crowd strike blowout. We don't have to talk politics. Like the crowds, riddle me this. No intelligent, oh, he... no intelligent company does a rollout the way this thing rolled out and ate everybody. Right. Like, like, that apparently never happens, except now I can't say never. Um, it feels so to me the, like a major internal fuck up or sabotage. The the other reality is, I you you're totally right. CrowdStrike was insane to do that. Um, no other operating system entity uh, would would allow a, a random kernel uh, library to to be a take down the, the whole thing. System, yeah, yeah. I, I, well. Uh, don't get me started on Microsoft, but uh... and, and, you know, and and the 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 picture one the one of the classic pictures I have is in in my head from the the Twitters, uh, a guy on a really tall ladder in an airport, you know, disassembling one of the displays. It's like, not only, <laughs> not oh only God. did it like, I mean, you have to go to the physical terminal and yeah. and unbrick the thing. You know, it's like. <laughs> They probably had to open cabinets and and lockers yeah. and places yeah, the that whole, nobody's like, ever display, been into. Like, and and yeah, where, like where people insane. have lost the keys to the locker or something. Yeah. It's like, ah, Bob, do you know where the keys are? <laughs> who who is the person who used to maintain this five years ago? Yeah, it's insane. The, the other the other classic one is uh, I I think it's uh, Southwest Airlines is still on Windows three one and they're like, what BSOD? <laughs> 
<laughs> what crowd strike? Oh God. <laughs> So, so Southwest wasn't in that system. Is that what you're uh, saying? They, uh, yeah, they're, everybody else is on Windows 10 or whatever. And, and Microsoft has been bugging them for a decade or whatever. Guys, you got to get off 3.1. You got to get off 3.1. Now they're like, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, we, didn't, we weren't hurt. Southwest does have another problem, though. It's got hot rod pilots. Have you been following that? No, no. There have been pilots that have been buzzing their girlfriends' houses and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> um, and the latest one is they is the the co-pilot bumped the yoke and caused the airplane to go into a dive, and they pulled it out at a hundred feet above sea level, and 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 so on. You know, I was in a Southwest flight um, from actually, I think it was. Seattle. I'd gone up to see uh, to see uh, Sam Hahn, and they were coming coming into Ontario. Now, when you come into Ontario, you 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 come in. They come in out of over the Mojave Desert, and there's this Cajon Pass where Highway 15 goes from basically from San Diego to Nevada to to Las Vegas. And so it's 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 a pass in tall mountains. And they dropped down into the middle of the pass. So that basically we were we were below the peaks. And I thought it was a gorgeous view. When I when I flew airplanes, I always flew through the Cone Pass down right on the highway. But a, an airliner with with 90 passengers down 500 feet above the highway is 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 pushing it. Maybe he forgot what kind of airplane he was in. Well, you know, a seven thirty seven. Actually, you know, they're they're a hot rod airplane, and, and uh, but I I just I think it's amusing that 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 now TSA is or, or FAA is starting to take a look at the, the 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 radar signatures and saying you guys we're coming after you. I I wonder I I'm kind of expecting. Uh, uh, covid related uh neurological problems uh in pilots and air traffic controllers is going to be not a good thing uh -huh. that could creep in that could creep in there, there's yeah. certainly a lot of people saying that there's much more aggression aggression in general some of which can be possibly traced to brain irritation due to covid but certainly the rise in aggression is older than covid yeah but that doesn't mean it's not a factor. I think it is, actually. But <laughs> it's not the only factor. I'm sure of that, too. Uh, so I cute little uh, link I posted before I did post the Social Protocols Global Brain uh, mm -hmm. link. Uh, Microsoft blames European Con Commission for the outage. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I don't know how much of that is... Polit making political hay out of a, uh, out of an incident, but what they're saying is that the social the, the European Con Commission mandates Microsoft to not close kernel access. That is what that says. I don't know what to think about this. I'm also really interested in the in the liability. That Microsoft and or CrowdStrike yeah, might yeah. have here, like, but the number of businesses that were taken out, and the amount of economic damage, is gigantic. Yep, it yep. was it was really big. Uh, April was flying home. April just managed to duck through. She had, she gave a speech in Greensboro, oh, North Carolina. Decided to stay for an extra day just to sightsee because otherwise she wouldn't see anything in the town. That day was the worst day, and she and her the flight she was supposed to come home on the next day would have been canceled that day. Then on Saturday, she, she goes to the airport on Saturday. No screens are working, no technology, people with handwritten tickets moving around trying to figure out which gate is their flight. Um, but her flights make it with a little delay. She got home an hour later than expected, had everything worked flawlessly. So she snuck past the whole mess. But I was stunned that on Saturday, United's, uh, oh, sorry, ORD, United, no screens working. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, that's too long for this emergency to, to have crippled everybody that, that far. 
Does any of those company ever recognize liability for anything? I think they get sued a whole bunch, but they don't. I don't know that they get caught enough. But uh, I don't know. There's all you know. There's been, there was a lot, lot of, of litigation around lost luggage, for example, that caused a bunch of things to change. No, it's it's going to be inter interesting. Uh, by the way, you say, oh, uh, it's not politics. I agree. But of course, Dr. O found the link between uh, the, uh, the pol politics policy and uh, the outage. Basically, he has his latest entry is about how people can get kicked off uh, the big networks. Like, you know, these people who got kicked off Google, Microsoft, yada, yada, yada. And more and more business processes mandate that you have a google account or a microsoft account and so on and so forth and it's like okay so you get mandated to have that account you get kicked off i mean you don't you're not able to do anything and that means the, the, these companies have the power to nullify all your action as a citizen and there shouldn't that be a government function and the of course crowdstrike shows us the power of these being kept out of systems. But imagine if it's due not to uh, an accident like this one, or bad planning, but it's due to um, somebody's inter opaque internal process, which is often the case. That is certainly not imaginary. So the, the, the question of the power of uh, big companies on <laughs> our citizenship at a very deep level like he said, you know, my, my, my tax company says I have to use Microsoft to file my taxes. My accountant. Interesting. Well, it takes me back a little bit to Lawrence Lessig and code is law. Yeah, uh, this, totally. is, this, this is totally. sort of, this is a different but practical side effect of the same thing. It's like, you know, the requirements for code cause law and cause social disruptions. Hmm. Now, and from the Rather than a legal or democratic standpoint, of course, the other analysis is ecosystemic, right? We have monocultures. Monocultures are fragile. We know that. Crazy stuff. Other topics? Um, Pete, I, I thank you for your kind offer to help me think through my journey, mid journey. I had a miserable time trying to create uh, some graphics over the weekend. I was like trying to DIY it. I'm like, I am terrible at this. So I, I, I would love a little bit of help at some point when it's convenient for you. Um, this afternoon? Sounds wonderful. Uh, thank um, you. And and uh, I, I kind of said it, it may not be mid-journey that you're wanting. Um, because... I, tried this, I tried the same prompts on Creus and La Leonardo and also yeah. got nowhere. So I, I was having a bad time overall just trying to illustrate a blog post. And I finally gave up and used a, uh, an image, a regular picture. I'm also <laughs> shocked when you search for pictures that ought to exist, how they all seem to have been bought up by the stock image uh, companies so that a nice picture of a neuron or whatever that ought to be available in a scientific library and might be, but I didn't know how to get in there. Um, they're all Alamy or Shutterstock or whatever, and I hate that. It's like, no, these are just part of our, our patrimony. Hey, yeah. are you guys, if you jump on a Zoom call to to explore that that imaging issue, um, I'd love to sit in on that call. I think that's uh, technologically possible. <clears throat> um, right after this one or like an hour later or something? Uh, either way works for me, Mark. I'm fine. I'm flexible. Cool. So why don't we shut down the recorders or even get out of the call and get back in and then we can do a uh, a sesh. That'd be, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other topics. Uh, we had a really nice Neo books call this morning. I mean, not like we're agreeing on everything, there's a really interesting gap between how Klaus in particular sees Neo books and I see Neo books. It's very, one way of overgeneralizing it is top down versus bottom up. And Klaus is basically working with ChatGPT to generate documents that include nicely phrased GPT output of what he believes about uh, regenerative soil, uh, I mean, <clears throat> regenerative farming, soil health, whatever, whatever, plus uh, applications of uh, spiral dynamics for how to communicate. Okay, Kevin Jones gets interested. So Klaus uses ChatGPT to, to interview it and sort of put, write a couple more essays that, that Kevin likes, all of which are basically essays 
And I'm busy trying to say, okay, okay, those essays consist of a bunch of nuggets that roll up into the larger, the larger essay. And that there's like a gap there because Klaus refers to the essays as his nuggets, or maybe a really long essay as three nuggets rolled into an essay where I see like 20 nuggets because I like for me, the little, the little component parts are the things I want to modularize and reuse. Uh, and then Jose Leal is in the conversation and his interest sort of like Marc Antoine's is down under uh, each assertion or each whatever. Uh, Marc Antoine, I think the two of you have very complementary but very different, technically different visions. Uh, but you're both trying to figure out what is this assertion built on? And what does that mean for the nature of the argument and whatever else is going on? So we had a piece of that in, in the conversation uh, earlier today. Um, but I think as we do that, as we kind of uh, duke it out nicely in the calls, um, we wind up with each of us a better image of how to describe something that can serve most of us. Because the, the place I'm trying to get to is a mission description of neobooks that includes that includes comfortably the thing I want to get done and the reason I'm sort of doing this with the reason Klaus is doing this and how he's working around it and, and Jose and everybody else who's showing up. And impossible to make everybody happy, but I think there's a way of thinking about the, the, the project that does make a, a bunch of people more comfortable uh, and then would be a good way of describing this for everybody else. Julian, welcome to the call. We've been through like six topics already. <laughs> and I've only been through one. I just got out of the SIGGRAPH meeting. Oh, good, good. Hopefully that's going really well for you. Mm, that's a long pause. Right. That's a long pause. Okay. You're just to hear more about it, but I yeah, know Pete has we, a hand. Uh, we were kind of checking in, but let, let's let Pete go and then and then maybe you, Julian. Um. Uh, speaking of uh, Klaus and Kevin and and uh, ChatGPT, um, I I've I've had discussions uh, long discussions with Klaus. Klaus is doing great stuff with ChatGPT. I think um, he's also building a GPT that uses maybe it, it uses his new book as a knowledge source. Um, and when last I looked, he didn't actually have any uh, custom instructions. Um, uh, he did have a, a profile thing, or sorry, he doesn't have any um, memories uh, with ChatGPT. Um, so Kevin asked an interesting question. Here's the document. Can can we give it to the bot and then have it explain things to people or something like that? And it it runs into a model that I I have trouble with. Um, and I know this uh, Kyle has had this question too. Um, uh, Kyle and I and a few other people wrote a book about AI uh, that's available on Kindle. Um, uh, and part of the post exercise of that was Kyle taking uh, each of our segments of the book uh, and also some interviews that we kind of did with, with ourselves and fed that all to a GPT. And so now you can ask the GPT about the, the knowledge domain we were talking about. I don't, and, and Kyle's question, one of Kyle's presenting questions for that GPT is, would anybody use it? How would they use it? I, I, didn't, I do not yet have a good model for people who are chatting with a book or chatting with. Um, uh, and I wonder, I wonder if that's because I'm lacking imagination or because it's not as useful as you think it would. Um, in, in some detailed conversations with Klaus, what I suggested is actually, this would be a great thing for not the public to access a book, but for specialists to say, uh, to talk to a member of the public and say, what are you trying to do? Um, uh, you know, uh, let me, let me think for a bit. And, and their thinking process would be consulting. Like a, like a domain matter expert. Yeah. I, I, my, my supposition is that a GPT who can chat with you about the contents of a corpus really needs a domain expert to help you ask the right questions of the bot. I, I don't see that people have a native ability to, to be con conversant uh, with a chat bot in a direction that gets them a lot of satisfaction about um, interrogating information space. I, it, it takes a, a fair bit of, it, it takes a, an understanding of the knowledge space at, you know, at least a rudimentary one. And then also it takes um, 
a, a fairly good understanding of what makes sense to ask a bot and what doesn't make sense to ask a bot. I, so I, I'm definitely, I, I know I can get what I want out of a corpus, um, but it's because I know what's generally in the corpus and I know generally how to work with the bot. Right. I, is, am I missing something or can you Those just two say, seem like prerequisites to me chat with a corpus and you'll, you'll be enlightened. <laughs> Um, Mark Antoine. I'm thinking a lot about this as a almost business proposition in the sense that the main case I saw, I think I mentioned it before, is political parties saying, this is my platform. This is what I want to do. This is what I think the impact will be. This is. And then so, somebody from the public says, okay, I care about issue X. What in the platform could impact issue X or what's in it for me, really? And it's clear that it will be easier for the a layperson to chat with a, a corpus that is in a technical language that they do not understand and ask the LLM, okay, explain this to me. Like, what does this mean to me? What's the implication of this? And, and I expect this to be backed by a knowledge base so that what has been thought about by the party is in the knowledge base. And, and 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 so you can say, well, I think that this policy would have this implication, which is relevant to your query. Oh, here it may also have this inclination, but I don't have this in the knowledge base, so I don't know if this is part of the implicit promise. This may be something I'm coming up with as an LLM hallucination, so it would have to be checked. But the idea of being able to say, I have a representation of someone's official position on something. And then having a conversation with uh, what does that mean in my terms? What does that mean for my issues? What does that mean for whatever? I see that as a very, very potentially useful application for, you know, a group who has an official position that they need to present and that is maybe not easy to extend, explain uh, because there's too many aspects, there's too, too much legal language or technical language or whatever. Um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And even in that case, the, the missing link for me is the, the subject matter expert. So I think most people, and it, it's, a, it's a great uh, practical application. I think most people are able to say to either a technical expert, well, I, I, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a laundromat owner. Um, uh, I need to know uh, can I, you know, and I want, I want to hire uh, these people who don't have uh, immigration status. Is that something that's allowed under your platform or not allowed? That's so a very good example. I, I think, um, I, I think you need uh, to, to have a, the, the level up conversation, you know, a technical subject matter expert would say, uh, well, here are the kinds of laws that you need to talk, to think about or whatever. And I think an LLM can do that. But I don't think the laundromat owner is going to say, what's in your platform that relates to, you know, employment, blah, blah, blah. What they're going to say is, can I hire this person or can't, you know, am I not able to hire this person? So they, they, need, to they need to construct the question in a practical, uh, practical question about their business case, right, or their use case. Uh rather than an abstract kind of librarian perspective or a research librarian perspective into, you know, into it. No, no, that, that, that makes perfect sense to me, but you don't think that the LLM will be able to apply to find the relevant parts of the law that would apply to the case? Um, I, I think, I, I think you're not going to, with, without a, you know, without a librarian, a research librarian in the middle, I'm not sure that the LLM is going to volunteer to be a good research librarian to, to think about, uh, you know, okay, so you're talking about immigration status, you're talking about, uh, you know, employment law. Let me kind of look through the, the platform for those parts and put that together for you. I, in, in that particular case, I think an LLM is actually probably a pretty good um, uh, research librarian. Uh, but uh, um, uh, for for something more technical, uh, like Klaus, uh, Klaus maybe has a corpus, uh, or Kevin has a corpus 
um, very detailed. Kevin made a, a kind of a good comment in, in a thread, uh, in an email thread that I'm part of. Uh, Klaus had generated an amazing amount of like uh, written stuff where the bot understood, um, in this case, I think it was Klaus's uh, corpus, and it can write in general terms about it. But Kevin said something like, but it, it doesn't know how to apply that to a, a complex situation, right? The way a, a technical yeah. expert would. So yeah, that is certainly believable. Um, so something like, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the problem, one of the problems Klaus has recognized in uh, the field of farms, farm to table kinds of things. And there are people willing to make uh, uh, consumer, consumer goods out of food but there's a, a person in the middle that's a uh, uh, milling. They, they need milling for the grain to get it all the way through. Um, I'm not sure that the LLM will, will conceptualize the whole chain of you know, a complicated thing and say, here's the things that are missing, the way a, a, a person would be thoughtful about it. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Anybody else on this? Cool. Other thoughts? Julian, do you want to report in any status on SIGGRAPH? Re real quick, I'm sorry, Julian. Um, the the best use of um, best use of LLMs I've I've been experiencing, and as I work with people, I experience is that it's a great assistant to a person who's being thoughtful. Uh, it's you can ask an LLM to be thoughtful, but you may or may not get thoughtfulness out of it. You may or may not got, get deep strategic planning or or of thinking out of it, you know, it, it will pretend that it's thinking, but it, it works a lot better when you're, you're pairing a bot who's language capable um, and has con a lot of context with somebody who can actually think through things and be creative about that and stuff like that. So that's the... So the human brain part of it is quite important. Still for, for now. Yeah. Yep, thanks. Go ahead, Julian. It's quite a segue that this is under discussion because I just came from a SIGGRAPH meeting. I uh, was talking to one of the people who's going to be on a panel next Tuesday, and we were discussing the. So this particular panel is three pretty distinguished artists uh, who are talking about whatever they want to talk about. Basically, these these guys are is distinguished. One of them is this year's retro award winner. Um, another one is in the Smithsonian. I was talking to Miko is the one I was just talking to. She designed, she's done a lot of artwork, a lot of industrial artwork. She designed the connection machine, um, not the circuitry and the CPUs and all that, but the the machine, the look of the machine. The, the cabinetry? Uh, the cabinet, well, also the computer. Hmm. So, right, because like Hillis was doing all these CPUs and all these network connections between them, but she designed what the thing actually looked like. So, hmm. uh, and one of the issues that came up, because I know because this panel is addressing artwork that the subject of AI is going to come up and LLMs and mid-journey and all of this stuff. Um, she mentioned that her cousin has been put out of work by AI. He's an illustrator, a concept illustrator, and his former clients are all now using AI to do their explorations into concept illustration instead of hiring him. So one of the things that I'm going to make sure that the, this panel addresses next week is the Luddite movement. Uh, and uh, uh, another topic was, uh, let's see, the I, whether artists feel uh, at, at all encroached by all the scraping that's done of their work without compensation. Uh, so status report on SIGGRAPH is this, this is one of the panels. It's next Tuesday. Um, if, if you want to pop into Denver, I have an extra registration code. Um, uh, let's see. Actually, I think that works for online access, too. Uh, and then there's another panel on Thursday morning, which is going to be pretty interesting because, you know, obviously I've been working with all of the, all of these people. Let's see. Yeah. There you go. And these two authors are going to be talking about this book. And I'm having looked at this book now, it's going to be pretty interesting. The Denver, um, the Denver event is a subcommittee or a regional meeting, or it's not the big SIGGRAPH, right? It's the big one. Oh. Okay. Huh. Yeah, but that's why I've been fretting for the last four months. Uh, it's, it opens Sunday. Uh, I have to be there Friday, but the official opening is Sunday morning. 
Um, let's see. I'm also running the session on the Center for Computer Graphics History. This one's going to be more informal rather than an academic presentation. And then there's just a, a ton of stuff as usual going on at SIGGRAPH. Any particular minute of the day has a multiplicity of at least two in terms of things that you should be doing. So, so have you had yourself cloned already? Yeah. I really wish David Brin's novel, Killing People, was reality instead of uh, fiction. Too bad. So close. Anyone else thoughts about SIGGRAPH? Suggestions? Questions? Cool. Uh, AOB, any other business? If not, we can melt this call and re, re, uh, Pete and Mark and I are going to reconvene to talk about how to make text to image generators do more for us because I had a bad weekend trying to make them do something and got nothing. You good, Jack? All right. Um, let's. Um, let's Jerry, yeah. You know how when you tell a three year old to do something and they do exactly what you tell them to do? Yeah, yeah. It's like rule working by rules. Well, this, these things are about three years old, right? So, <laughs> I wish. I mean, I tried that, and it wasn't. It, it was like the work by rules didn't didn't work for me. So, I I may just not be describing things well, and I need to be trained to describe better. But bah, so frustrating. Um, cool. So let's fold this. Wait one minute and come back into the same room. That'll get rid of the recordings and all that. Uh, and thank you, Pete. We'll be right back. Yeah, sure thing. Okay. okay. I'll see you in two weeks. So. All right. Yeah. Good luck. Enjoy. Ciao. No coming back. Ciao.